In the 19th and 20th century, Shanghai was known to many as the most decadent city in the world. At the core of the decadence was a ruthless crime syndicate that epitomized old Shanghai. They were known as the Green Gang. The Green Gang was a powerful Chinese organized crime group that dominated Shanghai's underworld for decades. Although a lot of the gang's history is surrounded by mystery and myth, most historians agree that the gang not only played a pivotal role in the history of Chinese organized crime, but the history of China as a whole. In this video, we will cover the entire historical timeline of the secret society, from the gang's origins all the way to their demise. The exact origins of the Green Gang are very complex and still debated amongst historians to this day. The historian Jerome Chen was quoted saying that the history of the Green Gang is a blend of facts and fiction, often more fiction than facts. However, based on the full historical context, we can try our best to separate the myths from the facts. Historians generally agree that the Green Gang was formed as a criminal organization in the late 1800s, but the roots trace back to a much earlier time to something not criminal in nature. The origins of the gang can be found in a 15th century Buddhist movement called Luoism, aka the Way of the Luo. The Luo was an evangelical Buddhist sect that was created by the patriarch Luo. This sect also evolved from a much earlier society called the White Lotus. From the 15th to 17th century, many Luo groups formed in China. One of these groups was introduced to the boatmen of the Grand Canal in the early 17th century by three men who are known as the Three Patriarchs. This Luo sect specific to the boatmen came to be known as the Pan Men or Pan Sect. The Pan Sect served as a labor union organization for the boatmen who specialized in the transport of tribute rice and provided the workers with things such as medical, unemployment, and disability pay. Over time, different Luo associations were established for every boat fleet. By the 1800s, these organizations became very powerful and the Chinese government feared their growing influence. The leaders of these Luo boatmen groups progressively became corrupted by their own power and started getting involved in illicit activities such as extortion and even murder. This was the first instance of criminal elements within the Green Gang's lineage. Circumstances changed for the boatmen in the mid-19th century due to natural and man-made disasters that impacted the Yellow River. These events destroyed the once thriving industry for boat workers and put 40 to 50,000 men out of work. The boatmen organizations dissolved from these poor economic conditions and they began looking to finesse their way into new areas. The unemployed boatmen became desperate and were willing to do anything they could to make money. At the time, the government had a monopoly on the salt trade. The boatmen saw an opportunity to dominate the salt industry through black market trade. Many of the boatmen became salt smugglers by bringing salt from northern China to the ports of the Yangtze River. Eventually, the salt smugglers formed their own organization, the Anqing Daoyu, or Anqing League. This is the first evidence of the formation of a group founded on a criminal activity. The Anqing League is where historians believe the Green Gang, or Qing Bang, is directly descended from. It is theorized that the Qing in Qing Bang is a shortened version of the word Anqing. Others believe that the Qing comes from the word Qing Pi, which was a Subay term for salt smugglers. The most prominent salt smuggler at this time was a man named Xu Baoshan. Xu was a prominent member of the Anqing League, and he dominated salt smuggling in the lower Yang Valley and had over 10,000 followers. Xu was significant because he was one of the first men who transitioned the Anqing League into the Green Gang. The livelihood of the boatmen would change once again, this time due to technological advancements. In the late 1800s, the mass use of steamships replaced the smaller junk boats. This caused the boatmen to once again be out of work. These unemployed men and salt smugglers would pour into the city of Shanghai to work on the docks. This was around the time when these new dock workers officially organized themselves as the Green Gang. This new founded organization was based on the old societies and served as a force to protect the workers. These men who already had experience in minor illegal activities were now willing to engage in all crimes and were ready to use violence towards anyone in their way. The Green Gang appeared to be a unified gang, but it was never one single entity. The organization was made up of several gangs or families from all around the city. The Green Gang had countless associates, 
but only sworn men who went through initiation rituals were considered official members. There were four generational status groups of hierarchy in the gang. The Shui, the Wu, the Tang, and the Da. At the time, Shanghai was China's main center for commerce, and also the most cosmopolitan city in the nation. The city was also carved up in three ways by the British, the Americans, the French, and the ruling Qing dynasty of China. The British and American side was known as the International Settlement, and the French territory was called the French Concession. The International Settlement, the French Concession, and the Chinese Zone all had different jurisdictions and law enforcement. Therefore, someone could theoretically commit crimes in one jurisdiction and flee to the next with impunity. This unusual dynamic of a city created the perfect climate for vice and organized crime. In these years, Shanghai came to be known as the most decadent city in the world, with every vice being catered to, such as prostitution, gambling, and drug use. In the early 20th century, opium was the most popular drug of choice for Chinese. Opium smoking in Shanghai ran rampant, and opium dens were found all around the city. The city's thriving market gave the Green Gang the perfect opportunity to rise to the top. Using their knowledge of shipping and ports, the Green Gang began to smuggle opium into the city. From here, the Green Gang's influence grew, and they became involved with every criminal racket possible, eventually dominating Shanghai's underworld entirely. This brings us to one of the earliest known leaders of the Green Gang, Zhang Renkui. Zhang Renkui was a notorious gangster and military man from the Shandong province. He was a loyal follower of Xu Baoshan and would go on to play a key role in the criminal and political sphere of China. Zhang can be best described as the man who bridged the gap between the An Qing League and the development of the modern Green Gang. Another prominent gangster in Shanghai at this time was a man named Fang Guito. Fang Guito was a kingpin who dominated the seaports and the smuggling of salt into Shanghai. However, he got into the opium business by the early 1900s. Fan eventually started making a fortune by arranging the theft of opium from foreign ships. Eventually, foreign investors put pressure on the Qing government to capture him, so he was arrested and sent to prison in 1906. This created a power vacuum for gangsters all around the city and allowed Zhang Renkui's gang, the Big Eight mob, to rise to the top. Along with the dilemma of crime, the political situation in China was turbulent as well. At this time, there was a strong growing sentiment of revolution against the Qing dynasty by several groups. In China, the line between gangster and revolutionary was already thin for several reasons. For centuries, organized crime groups and revolutionary groups shared a lineage dating back to the mid-17th century, when the foreign Manchu Qing dynasty replaced the Ming dynasty as the ruling monarchy of China. Groups such as the Tian De Wei, or the Heaven and Earth Society, were created as a secret society by Han Chinese to plot the overthrow of Manchu rule in order to restore the Ming dynasty. These secret societies eventually deteriorated into criminal organizations and came to be known as the Triads. This takes us to one of the most important figures in modern Chinese history, Sun Yat-sen. Sun Yat-sen was a Chinese statesman, philosopher, and revolutionary who was known as the father of the nation of China. Sun was born in Guangdong in 1866. In his twenties, he became Western educated and traveled throughout America and Europe, where he was inspired by the ideas of republicanism. He came to theorize that China needs to modernize and can only achieve this by eradicating its monarchy and replacing it with a more democratic government. He also incorporated ideas of Chinese nationalism into his philosophy to further justify the dissolution of the non-Chinese Qing dynasty. In order to gain more support, Sun Yat-sen associated with many secret societies who shared anti-Qing sentiments, including the Ji Kung Tang, the Tian De Wei, and of course, the Green Gang. Sun was known to have many friends from secret societies, including his close friend, Zheng Shilang. Zheng Shilang was a member of the Tian De Wei and would go on to raise money and mobilize thousands of triad members for Sun Yat-sen's revolutions. After failed uprisings, Sun was banished to Japan by Qing authorities. While in exile, Sun Yat-sen formed his own secret society in 1905 called the Tang Meng Wei. The Tang Meng Wei was loosely based on the Tian De Wei, Freemasonry, and other Chinese secret societies, 
with the sole purpose of revolting against the Qing dynasty. With most of the Chinese crime groups and secret societies already on his side, Sun now only needed Green Gang members to join his ranks. Mob boss Zhang Renqui supported the revolution and would become a major general in Sun's army. Also joining the movement were Green Gang members Chen Qi Mei and Yang Gui Xin. These two gangsters were very well respected and feared in the city, and their support for Sun's movement proved to be crucial. They themselves eventually joined Sun's secret society in 1906, of which they became influential members. Chen and Ying then brought in thousands of Green Gang members into the revolutionary society who were willing to fight for the cause. These two young gangsters served as the middlemen between legitimate revolutionaries and the thugs of the underworld. Now with more money and support, the revolutionaries were ready to make their move. All the years of raising money, recruiting, and failed uprisings led to the 1911 revolution, when Sun Yat-sen and the revolutionaries were finally successful at overthrowing the Qing dynasty and establishing the Republic of China. After the revolution, Sun Yat-sen established the Nationalist Party called the Kuomintang, aka the KMT, and became the first provisional president of the republic. This was great news for the Green Gang. The gang's power and influence expanded to new heights for many years to come. Now on good terms with the standing government, the Green Gang had a lot more freedom to operate. Business revenue increased with opium sales, and the Green Gang became the dominant gang in Shanghai. The prominent Green Gang leaders of the post-revolution period were of course Zhang Renqui, who was now an opium kingpin, and the entertainment tycoon Gu Zhushuan who both ran their own large gangs in the Chinese and British sections of the city. These mob bosses, along with others, were the main men of the underworld during the late 1910s and early 1920s, and they also served as mentors to the more powerful gangsters to come. Their power was soon to be outshined by rising stars in the underworld from the French concession, who would go on to take Chinese organized crime to levels never seen before. The phenomenal rise of the French concession Green Gang begins with a notorious gangster named Huang Jinrong. Huang Jinrong was one of the biggest gangsters in the French concession by the 1920s, and ironically was also the chief detective of the police force. Huang's career began as a detective in 1892. He rose up in the ranks because of his ability to solve crimes by any means necessary. Eventually, Wang associated with Green Gang criminals and became involved with drug smuggling, gambling, prostitution, and extortion. By using his connections with the French police, Wang operated with impunity and created his criminal empire. Later on, Wang Jinrong met a female gangster named Lin Guisheng. Lin was a prominent underworld figure specializing in the operation of brothel houses. Wang and Lin met in the late 1800s and fell in love with each other. The two got married in the year 1900, forming a spiritual bond and a criminal alliance. Some even go as far to say that Lin Guisheng was the brains of her husband's operations, and she even organized gangs to steal opium for him. Along the way, Wang was introduced to a rising star in the underworld named Du Yusheng. Du Yusheng was born in 1888 in Shanghai. He was a young hoodlum from the streets and was doing anything he could to support himself and his family. He eventually joined the Green Gang in his teens and became involved in various criminal activities. Du met Wang's wife through some Green Gang members and began working for her. Lin was impressed by the young man and she introduced Du to Wang Jinrong. Wang was also impressed and he gave Du the responsibility of running some of his major opium dens. Du became Wang's most trusted lieutenant by the early 1920s and the pair grew their criminal empire together. Through Du's hard work in the underworld, his power and influence would eventually surpass Wang's to become the most powerful figure in the Green Gang. Around this time, the criminal pair met another prominent gangster from Shanghai named Zhang Xiaolin, and together they came to be known as the Three Kings of Shanghai. In the 1920s, life was good for the criminals of Shanghai. However, the same could not be said for the average Chinese citizen. Although the revolutionaries succeeded at overthrowing the Qing dynasty, they failed to successfully unite all of China under the Republic. As a result, 
the regions of China became plagued by warlords from 1916 through the 1920s. To combat the warlords and unite China under one government, the KMT formed an alliance with China's Communist Party. The alliance was known as the First United Front, which absorbed the Communists into the KMT. The Nationalist Army, which was the military arm of the KMT, was headed by the famous general and future ruler of China, Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang Kai-shek was a close associate of Sun Yat-sen and was a controversial figure who had many underworld contacts. It was known that he hung around gangsters in his younger years, and he was a close friend of the Green Gang leader, Chen Chi Mei. Some even go as far to say that Cheng was a Green Gang member himself, but this claim has never been officially proven. In the 1920s, Chiang Kai-shek used the Green Gang for money and muscle, while the Green Gang used Chiang so they could operate freely from the law. With the death of Sun Yat-sen in 1925, the relationship between the Nationalists and the Communists within the Republic broke down. Chiang Kai-shek eventually purged the Communists from the KMT, and tension between the two groups spread throughout China. In Shanghai, the Communists started organizing massive labor strikes in order to give the international settlements back to the Chinese. But Chiang Kai-shek feared that the Communists in Shanghai would eventually rebel and control the city. In the April of 1927, the Communists of Shanghai staged a massive strike. Chiang Kai-shek panicked, but he knew there was one man who could put an end to the strike. It was none other than the mob boss, Du Yusheng. Chiang eventually reached out to Du Yusheng and asked him to handle the situation. Du and the Green Gang knew that a communist takeover would mean the end of organized crime in China, so they unanimously agreed to side with Chiang Kai-shek and the Nationalists. This alliance led to a pivotal moment in Chinese history on April 12, 1927, known as the Shanghai Massacre, when Du Yusheng's men slaughtered communists indiscriminately in the streets. The massacre was brutal, and it took over eight truckloads to remove all the bodies from the streets. The bloody aftermath of the Shanghai Massacre resulted in Chiang Kai-shek's nationalists fully taking control of the city. As a reward for Du's service to the nationalists, Chiang Kai-shek granted him special privileges which gave Du unrivaled power and status. Du was named a general in the Nationalist Army and then president of the National Board of Opium Suppression Bureau. This position allowed Du to seize his competitor's opium and resell it for his profit. With this leverage, Du became the most powerful gangster in China, and the Green Gang was now an untouchable force in the underworld. Du Yusheng's new status allowed him to enter mainstream society, become a respected member in politics, and become a member of the social elite. Du opened his own bank in 1929 called the Cheng Wai Bank. He sat on the board of the Bank of China, the Shanghai Municipal Council, and the Shanghai Chamber of Commerce. He was also a director on the Shanghai Stock Exchange. With all this authority and power, the once poor and uneducated hoodlum transformed into one of Shanghai's most influential citizens. Du's newfound status also benefited other gangsters, as his connections allowed many other criminals to rise up the ranks and join mainstream Chinese society. This infestation of gangsters within the Republic would eventually hurt their reputation and fuel their enemies, the Communists. By the 1930s, the Green Gang's influence was not only spreading beyond the borders of Shanghai, but also the borders of China. They managed to have a connection in the United States with the Mafia through Jewish gangsters from Shanghai. The Jewish community in Shanghai dates back centuries, when prominent Jewish families like the Sassoons made a fortune off of opium smuggling into China in the 1700s. Additionally, thousands of European Jews immigrated to Shanghai in the early 1900s and created a thriving community. While most of these Jews were upstanding citizens, some of them got involved in the underworld. By the mid-1930s, these Jewish gangsters collaborated with the Jewish mob from New York through a man named Jacob Yasha Katzenberg. Katzenberg was a well-known drug trafficker in the American Mafia and had close ties to the most powerful Jewish and Italian gangsters like Arnold Rothstein, Lepke Buckhalter, Meyer Lansky, Lucky Luciano, etc. In 1935, Katzenberg was sent to Shanghai by Buckhalter and Lansky in order to expand their drug operations. Through the Jews of Shanghai, 
Katzenberg met Du Yusheng and the Green Gang, and he began working for them. Katzenberg helped the Green Gang tremendously because he taught them how to refine opium into heroin on a massive scale. The increase in production allowed the gangsters to arrange a massive smuggling operation from Shanghai and Hong Kong into the United States through female mules. The operation, which included six large shipments of Dew's opium, totaled an over $10 million profit, which is over $200 million today. In the late 30s, business for the gang continued to boom, but things were about to radically change. The Japanese army invaded China in 1937, which eventually led to China's involvement in World War II. Japanese forces invaded Shanghai, which put a pause on criminal operations. The communists and nationalists put their differences aside again to fight against the Japanese. Du Yusheng and the Green Gang used all their resources to support the Chinese military and even mobilized their gangsters to fight against the Japanese. After three months of brave fighting, the Chinese army was defeated and the Japanese took control of Shanghai. With the Japanese controlling Shanghai, the Green Gang was in disarray. To avoid persecution from the Japanese, many gangsters fled the city. One of these men fleeing was none other than the most powerful man in Shanghai, Du Yusheng. Du escaped to Hong Kong where he arranged for weapons and goods to be sent to the Chinese army. He also had goods sent to Chinese victims of war through the Chinese Red Cross. While Du managed to escape and live a safe life, other prominent members of the Green Gang stayed in Shanghai. Some of these gangsters who stayed became traitors and worked for the Japanese, like Yu Yu Feng, Wu Si Bao, and Shi Ai Jen. The most notable traitor was one of the three kings of Shanghai, Zhang Xiaolin, and his treachery led to his execution by Green Gang members. Huang Jinrong also stayed in Shanghai, but he pretended to be insane to avoid cooperating with the Japanese. When China was liberated from Japanese occupation in August 1945, the gangsters were back in business. However, their power decreased significantly. Chiang Kai-shek's government no longer needed the Green Gang as muscle, so they lost their political support. Du Yusheng then returned to Shanghai, but he was not welcomed by everyone because they felt he abandoned his people. By this time, Du Yusheng's power and wealth also decreased significantly, and he became addicted to his own supply of opium. To add more insult to injury, the Chinese civil war between the communists and nationalists reignited immediately after World War II. Mao Zedong's communist forces began to take over China, and with this, the Green Gang's future was greatly threatened. By the June of 1949, the civil war reached Shanghai, and in less than a month, the communists declared victory. Knowing the communists were going to destroy everything the Green Gang built, Du Yusheng fled to Hong Kong. It was here that he lived a very mediocre life and died in 1951 due to illness from opium abuse. With Du Yusheng gone and the communists winning the civil war, this meant the near end of all criminal organizations in China. Mao swore to rid China of prostitution, the drug trade, and other illegal activities, which forced all gangsters to give up their underworld careers. The losing nationalists fled China and set up their new government in Taiwan, and many gangsters followed to be key figures in the development of the nation. Huang Jinrong, who stayed in Shanghai, was forced to sweep the streets and publicly denounce his criminal activities as reparations to the state. Because of Huang's popularity, the state felt it would be better to force him to apologize rather than to kill him. Huang's official statements forced all Green Gang members and associates to retire, and the once unstoppable crime group was officially dismantled in 1951. Since this, gangs have mostly been eradicated from China, but they thrive elsewhere. Today, the remnants of the Green Gang can be found in Hong Kong and Taiwan triad groups, where they still wield a lot of power. With the Green Gang gone, Shanghai lost the shady element it once had. And since their downfall, China has yet to see a criminal organization of the same vast magnitude in any region. The gang was the epitome of the old city, and was the obvious conclusion of the social, political, and economic problems of the time. Although the gang is gone with history, their impact and role in the underworld and politics of Shanghai is undeniable, 
and we come to the conclusion that one cannot tell the story of old Shanghai without mentioning the Green Gang.